Welcome to our MJA podcast, the series, Deep Into the Woods, Missing Persons, Unsolved Crimes, and the Does. My name is Mark, and I am your host for tonight's podcast. This is Episode 6, Part B, The Disappearance of Donald Messier on October 18, 2006, 34-year-old Donald Messier of Waterbury Center was reported missing by family members to the Vermont State Police. Messier was last seen at a party in Waitsfield in the early morning hours of Sunday, October 15, 2006. It has been said 50 to 60 people plus were at the party, but no one saw Donald leave the party. There was no trouble at the party that would have caused the 34-year-old to disappear. Since his disappearance, there has been no cell phone, bank account, or credit card activity. Messier did not return to work on Monday and has not contacted friends or family members since that date. There have been no signs of Donald Messinger or his truck. He was driving a red 1997 Ford F-150 pickup truck with a NASCAR number displayed in the rear window. The truck was displaying a Vermont registration B as in boy, G as in Gary, G as in great, 890. That's B G G 890. There is also no information to suggest foul play at this time. Let's take a pause for the cause for this special announcement. This is a MJA public service announcement. Unidentified males, more commonly known as John Doe's. Unidentified white male. John Doe was discovered on July 24, 1989, outside of Anchorage, Alaska. John Doe's estimated age, 20 to 40 years old. The badly decomposed body of John Doe washed ashore on the west side of Fire Island near Anchorage, Alaska on July 24, 1989. Unidentified Black Male The Black John Doe was discovered on July 10, 1982 in Maricopa County, Arizona. The black John Doe's estimated age, 25 to 30 years old. John Doe collapsed in Casa Grande at Dale Vance Farms where he was picking fruit. The person who hired him for labor that day said his name may be Levis Bailey, but this information was never able to be confirmed. Unidentified white male. The white John Doe was discovered on November 26, 1983 in San Mateo County, California. John Doe's estimated age, 19 to 25 years old. John Doe was located on November 26, 1983 on Lower Pillar Point and Ocean Beach in Half Moon Bay. That is the end of our MJA public service announcement.
Welcome back to our MJA podcast, episode 6, part B, The Disappearance of Donald Messier. Also missing is his 1997 red F-150 pickup truck. 34-year-old Donald Messier went missing from Waitsfield, Vermont. We have a special guest on tonight's podcast, Chris. Chris is assisting MJA as a mountain guide in New Hampshire concerning the Moore Murray case. Welcome, Chris, to our MJA podcast. Thank you, Mark. It's good to be on the line with you. And Chris, can you tell our listeners a little about yourself? Uh, yeah. Uh, I grew up in central Vermont, um, you know, very rural area. A lot of woods, a lot of a lot of hiking and uh, hunting and snowmobiling and mo- motorcycling, dirt biking and uh, ski areas. Did a lot of skiing. And uh, um, how did you get interested in this type of work? Well, I used to do uh, uh, organized searches. I used to volunteer for that. And uh, I think the last one I did was in, in Middlebury. And uh, a girl came up missing in northern New Hampshire, in uh, West Stewartstown. I think it was uh, Selena Cass. And uh, I went up there on my own to do some searching on that one. I think it was several days after she went missing. It, uh, that following weekend, I went up that Saturday. And uh, uh, to my surprise... I didn't see any law enforcement around. Um, apparently, they were on the other side of the mountain looking at a, a lake or a pond. So I went about and searched up the, you know, the river beds and the bank and uh, log roads and side roads off of uh, Route 3, uh, heading north uh, from West Stewartstown. And, uh, you know, everywhere I went, uh, I noticed beer cans. That hadn't been there too long. They're, they're quite fresh, uh, you know, six pack mm-hmm. in one place, uh, you know, case, case and a half in another place. So, you know, it seemed to me there was a, you know, pretty serious teen drinking problem there. Um, and uh, I found some uh, interesting items on the riverbank that uh, I took pictures of. And uh, at the end of the day, they had the, the, the FBI had their command post at the school. So I went in there and uh, saw the, uh, the lead FBI agent there and gave him my information and photos that I had. And uh, uh, that was on a Saturday. And the, the following Monday morning. Uh, they were right back down on the river there in town, uh, searching at the dam where they had already searched prior. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that, that is when they found their body that, that Monday morning. And can you tell our listeners a little about Donald? Well, I'd never met Donald. You know, I knew of uh, the Messier family. Uh, but I hadn't personally met him. Um, but from what I understand from talking to his friends and family, uh, you know, he's a pretty decent guy. He's easygoing, um, you know, willing to help anybody out if they needed it. Uh, you know, a good, good friend. And um, is it true that Donald attended a party the night he went missing? Well, that's one of the few facts that we have. Uh, that is a fact that he... Uh, attended a party in Waitsfield. Um, we don't know how, much, how many people were there. It's rumored that uh, there were 50 to 60 people attending the party. Uh, people that, then I, I don't know how the extent of the interviews of the state police, uh, none of that has been disclosed, but, uh, uh, you know, it's been very quiet. So we don't know what time Donnie left the party. Uh, no one admits to uh, seeing him leave 
or who he left with. Well, I believe um, Amy told me she had talked to somebody, some people at the party, and as far as she can conclude, there was only five people from that party interviewed, and it didn't produce any results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think yes. they said the approximate <clears throat> time was he left between midnight and 1 a.m., yeah, I think around 1 a.m. or 1.30, they had a, a ping on his phone. Um, he called a friend of his, or, uh, you know, that number was rung up. Um, the friend didn't answer, and, uh, you know, that was the last known uh, call from, from Donnie's phone. Uh, you know, no one's seen, uh, seen Donnie or his pickup uh, since that party. But it, it is a fact that Donnie did attend that party. And please tell our listeners at this present time what you think happened to Donald. Well, there's a lot of scenarios going around, uh, a lot of rumor. Um, you know, we know he did attend the party, and we know there's no sightings of him after the party. You know, so one would conclude that, uh, you know, possibly something happened at that party. Um, you know, he was, you know, he did have some personal problems. He was, he was going through a divorce. Um, so, you know, he was, he was a little down, um, you know, probably hit the alcohol a little more than he should have been. Um, but, uh, you know, from speaking to his friends and families, they didn't think, uh, he was in a position where he would, uh, you know, try to commit harm to himself. Correct, yes. And there, is there any video footage anywhere that would show his last known location? Yeah, I don't believe there is. I haven't heard of any. Um, you know, it's in a pretty rural area. You know, it's a small town. Um, you know, nowhere near, you know, a bank or very close to a school where you might, might see video footage. Um, and I don't know if the state police have taken footage from those places. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, that was 2006, so I don't think there are too many cell phones at that time, you know, equipped with cameras. And this case has had water and air searches. Why do you think nothing has been found? Uh... Well, you know, the, uh, this red truck has never been found. Um, it's kind of hard to displace a red truck. You know, a big, a big Ford F-150 extended cab. Um, you know, there, there was, from talking to the family, uh, Amy, there was uh, air searches by the National Guard who were doing exercises. So they volunteered to incorporate that into their exercise. Um, I know Amy had a friend who was a pilot. Who, uh, who who covered a lot of a lot of ground, um, you know, and that was a time of year where uh, the foliage was dropping, so visibility was pretty good. And uh, you know, they they came up with nothing. Uh, they've they've searched the reservoirs, you know, with uh, you know depth finders and you know fish finders, and uh, the state police had their way of doing it, and uh, they they came up with nothing. And have you been out? they're doing recon for upcoming ground searches. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been working with Amy for, well, roughly about eight months now. And, um, you know, we're going back and uh, looking at everything. You know, there's a lot of scenarios, a lot of rumors. Um, so basically we're starting at uh, square one, and we're not uh, discounting anything. Um, it is possible that... Uh, you know, Donnie went off and went off the road somewhere and uh, just hasn't been found yet. Um, it's kind of unlikely unless he uh, drove into a body of water somewhere that hasn't been searched. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're going to look at everything. Okay. And do you have any suspects that stick out more than others? 
Uh, there's been a few su suspects from day one, um, you know, through the rumor mill, and uh, their names are continue are continuously out there and still out there today. Uh, and over the last uh, several months, uh, there's a few names that uh, people of interest that uh, have popped up. So we're we're looking at all the avenues here. And do you ever get the feeling that you're close to locating Donald? I think uh, I think we're closer than we have been. Um, you know, Donnie's case had been quiet for for a number of years. Uh, I hadn't heard anything about Donnie's case uh, up until. Uh, last year at this time, uh, when Amy did a uh, podcast on The Vanished. And uh, so I, I happened to catch that uh, podcast, and, you know, I went on the state police website and, uh, you know, noticed how many uh, cold cases and missing persons cases there were that were still open. And, and you, uh, pardon? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And do you think Donald's disappearance has to do with a personal relationship, or was it a random act, or was it a serial killer? I don't. I don't see any any links to to a serial killer. Um, uh, personal, you know, he was going through a divorce. Um, he uh, uh, there there was a. a a young lady that he had interest in who, uh, you know, other associates of hers uh, didn't quite care about. Um, and I know some damage was done to, to her vehicle by one of them. So it could very well be that, uh, uh, you know, he was confronted by... Uh, um, by someone who was involved uh, uh, with that young lady. And is there anything you would like to add about the investigation? Well, it's an ongoing investigation. Um, we're going to keep digging. Uh, you know, the the state police are apprised of what we're what we're doing. Um, um, Amy's a very determined woman. She wants to find out what happened to her brother. And she's as determined now, I think, as she was the day after Donnie went missing. Um, so as long as she keeps that determination, uh, you know, I'm going to stick with her. We're going to keep digging. We're going to look through all the avenues and rumors from the rumor mill. And uh, we're going to, you know, wade through the swamp and uh, pick out the facts from each rumor, because most rumors have have a little bit of fact to them, a little bit of truth to them, and uh, you know, set the rest aside and uh, go from there. And hopefully, within a short period of time, we can we can find out something. Uh, you know, it's been this is the 11th year since uh, Donnie's disappearance. Uh, you know, it's about time somebody starts talking. And I think uh, I think with the, the media coverage that we're starting to get and the word getting out there and I think people are getting nervous, um, and uh, uh, certain people have started talking already. Uh, you know, we just have to sift through it and pick pick out facts from fiction. Okay. Thanks, Chris, for being on tonight's podcast. We look forward to speaking with you again. When we come back to the podcast, we have a very special guest on tonight's podcast, the victim's sister, Amy. We'll be back in a moment with Amy's interview.
Welcome back to our MJA podcast. This is episode 6, part B. 34-year-old Donald Messenger and his red Ford 150 F-150 pickup truck went missing on October 15, 2006 from Waitsfield, Vermont, and he was last seen attending a party. On the line, we have the victim's sister, Amy. Welcome, Amy, to our MJ podcast. How are you doing this evening? I'm good, Mark. How are you? I'm just fine. And I heard on October 14th, 2017, you held an event for your brother, Donald. Can you tell our listeners what the event was for and tell us a little more about the GoFundMe page? On October 14th, we held a Calcutta fundraiser trying to raise some reward money um, on my brother's behalf in hopes that we might develop some leads or a break in his case. We sold 80 balls and served a um, spaghetti dinner complete with salad, rolls, dessert. We had a DJ there for entertainment. We also did a silent auction. In addition to selling the 80 balls, Throughout the evening, we also raffled off an additional five balls to help raise even more money. Our goal was to raise somewhere between $2,000 and $2,500, and we raised over $3,900 in that one evening. That's very exciting news. Now, can you tell our listeners or families that might be listening in how you put something like that together? The biggest thing was trying to find a venue um, that would hold the event. We did it at our local Legion, which was great because they've got um, a nice big open area. They had a bartender there that evening doing a cash bar. They also have a full kitchen facility, which made it easy for me and my family to cook dinner for everybody. Um, Then I enlisted the help of um, a couple of my good friends that live locally that I've known my whole life, uh, Tracy Huff and Kim Huff. None of that would have been possible without them. They were really good about helping me sell tickets, or balls rather, to the event. Um, We hired a local DJ who not only helped kind of play music during dinner hour and keep the event going and keep people interested, he also helped pull the balls for the Calcutta. We, um, I think we paid money for the first ball that was pulled as well as the 40th ball. And we raffled off, like I said, five additional balls in between so that people would get, like, a second chance entry into the drawing. And we also did a silent auction that they people bought tickets for and got to pick which item they wanted to put their ticket in. We drew those probably three-quarters of the way through the Calcutta just to kind of break it up a little bit and keep it more interesting. And we it, just kind of – I'm sorry, go ahead, Mark. I was just uh, going to ask, did you have a lot of people at, attend the event? I think we served dinner to um, about 115 to 120 people probably. Oh, that's exciting. That's that's real good. And it was, it was a good evening. Everybody had a good time. And so let's get into your brother's case. When was the last time you actually saw your brother physically? Physically, the last time I saw him and talked to him was that Saturday morning, the day before he disappeared. We were fighting over bathroom time uh, because he was living with me at the moment. And we were both trying to get ready to go to work. So he was picking on me about how he only needed five minutes to get ready, not five hours like I did. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's a man's reaction to a lot of females when it comes to getting ready to go somewhere. So, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so uh, he sounded like a very interesting person to everybody that I've talked to about him. And it seems like you had a very good brother. And uh, like I said, I just hope we can help in some way. And... uh, with Chris and with our group, um, there's 44 of us right now. We're, uh, we took on an additional five cases, so we're looking to add three more staff members. 
And so, like I said, we just hope we can help in some way. And do you think his disappearance had anything to do with a personal relationship, or do you think it was a random act, or do you think it could have involved a serial killer? After this much time has passed, I really don't know what to think anymore. I guess just because we really don't have any sort of clear direction, I really can't rule anything out at this point. There's been absolutely no, no sightings of him or his truck, no activity on his cell phones, his credit cards, anything. So I guess I really can't rule much of anything out. And let's say Donald, um, <clears throat> excuse me, got into a one vehicle accident. Do you think in October 2006, you people would have noticed a path of a vehicle going off the road? I would think so because we literally drove hundreds if not thousands of miles on a, all the back roads in this area just looking for exactly that thing because there was no obvious sign of where he went so we looked and if there was something that looked weird on the side of the road we'd stop and we'd look deeper um you know and it was right before hunting season so there was a lot of people in the woods so if he had strayed off very far you would think that someone would have come across something and i'm going to read you a couple emails because um for some reason this case has generated a, a lot of people's interest has piqued their interest and I think since the la the first podcast we've done on Donald we've received over a hundred emails and one of the emails even come from one of uh, well two of our staff members their mother and daughter and anyway <coughs> their email was about um, okay they're researchers for our group okay they had never came across your brother's case and or didn't remember it and then um they done a little more research and they got the look and that probably the reason they missed your brother's case on certain researches they done in vermont new hampshire and all that was because our company tends to gravitate towards female victims instead of male victims now so since that was brought to my attention, I went over our case files, and yes, that is true. We have more female victims in our case files than we do male victims. And so we're going to try to change that. And, uh, and so once again, um, I don't know how that all came about or the dynamics or, or anything like that, but see, when we decide to work on a case, our whole staff votes on it. And uh, so, like I said, after they brought that to my attention, I went through the case files, and yeah, we have to change our policies. Uh, and like I said, I think out of, the, out of 90 cases, we only have like eight that are male victims. So we do have to change that and uh, take on more male victim uh, cases. And do you ever get the feeling while you're out searching that you're getting close to locating your brother? There's been times when I kind of got that gut feeling like we're close, but we're just not looking quite in the right place the right way, if that makes any sense. Like there's certain things that when I think about it, it just kind of makes, I get this pit in the, in my stomach and I just kind of feel like, no, that, that just, that, that just can't be right but you know I guess on some level probably I must be getting close somewhere somehow okay I'd like to think I am okay and do you ever feel like the answers are just around the corner I'd like to think they are I'd really like to be able to give my give our family and our friends that closure of knowing what happened that night and being able to bring him home and lay him to rest properly. And is there anything you would like to add? 
I don't think anybody can discount any information that they have. Um, something that you may not be able to place in context at the time or something that a conversation you've had with somebody that didn't really seem all that odd, just kind of think back on it now. There's been a couple of things that have come up when I've been talking with Chris that didn't didn't really hit me at the time, but kind of made a little more sense now that I've shared with him. Um, so just don't discount anything. Something that you may think is an insignificant detail may actually be something that's more relevant and pertinent to the case than you realize. Yes, that is true on a lot of cases, yes. And thanks, Amy for once again being on the podcast. I hope in the near future that MJA can help in some way with Chris's help. And we're going to take a short pause for the cause, and when we come back to the podcast, our next guest will be Callie, our, one of our profilers for criminal cases, social issues, and she's also a researcher. We'll be back in a moment with Callie's interview. Welcome, Callie, to our MJA podcast. This is episode 6, part B, the disappearance of 34-year-old Donald Messier and his 1997 Red Ford F-150 pickup truck from Waitsville, Vermont, on October 15, 2006, after attending a party. How are you doing tonight, Callie? I'm fine, Mark, and how about you? I'm just fine. And I know there isn't much information out there about this case, but there is some type of timeline that was done by the police. And so with the research that you could do on the case, what stands out to you the most, and, or are there several factors to Donald's disappearance? I see two major things, Mark, that stick out to me. First, it's been 11 years, and after intense searches of waterways, lagoons, etc., Donnie Messier's pickup has never been found. Secondly, Donnie Messier has not contacted any family or friends, nor have his remains been found. And the victim's family has ruled out about Donald being depressed mm -hmm. or suicidal. Donald was making plans in the coming days and for the future. Do you think the party holds the key to the answers to solve this case? Um, yes, and I'm going to go back to the family ruling out the depression and suicide as well. You cannot commit suicide and hide your vehicle unless it's in deep water. And since those waterways have been searched, um, and that's all been done. It's highly unlikely it is a suicide. As well, if a person commits suicide, their body is usually found, and his hasn't been. So um, 
going ahead with what you were asking about the party, I sure do think the party had uh, a role. Uh, everybody at that party should have been questioned by police. Um, this is a case of drawing assumptions and becoming narrow in thinking. Someone at that party holds knowledge of what happened to Donnie Messier, or at least some pre-knowledge of what happened to him. Well, um, his sister Amy talked to some of the, uh, the people at the party, and from what she can conclude, out of 50 to 60 people that was at the party, only five of them was questioned, and no revel relevant information came to play. So do you think it was a crime of passion in a personal nature? I do believe it's personal. Um, someone had something to gain by Donnie Messier being removed. It was likely committed in a rage. Um, it maybe didn't start off with the intent to remove him permanently, but ended up that way. And so you don't think it was a random act? A random act? Yeah. Well, possibly in that it escalated from a beef or an argument to a deadly trauma to Donnie Messier. The killer was jealous of Donnie Messier, of his goodness and his personality, and jealous of his likability and his success as a person. This person who murdered him may well have anger issues and a personality disorder. And so you don't think there's a possibility that we're dealing with a serial killer? I don't really think so, although this person's um, anger issues and personality disorder could take them to have either harmed or murdered someone else, yes. And sp speaking of Donald's personality, what makes you feel this way about the case? Because I've heard a lot of people talk about him in such a positive nature. And where did you gain uh, his insight to his personal nature? By reading about him or how did you come to that conclusion? Well, listening to his sister, her interview with you, and also the the press that was released on him, uh, it just it just seems to me that there's he's uh, that this is a very intense jealousy. Somebody who's been who just can't handle, or probably doesn't have much self esteem themselves, so they can't stand someone else having it. Okay, and speaking in those terms as a personal nature, we do know there's one suspect that has violent tendencies, and we do know he oh. was living with a female, and uh, now we don't, um, we don't know if him and the female was together at this time or split apart, but uh, somewhere along the line, Donald... Uh, develop a relationship with this female. Now, we don't know if it was in a romantic way or in a friendship way. And uh, so, yeah, that's been an issue from the get-go. There's two people of interest that needs to be questioned that, as far as we can tell, they haven't been questioned. Now, if you were hunting for a truck and a lot of the waterways have been searched, where do you think they got rid of the truck at? Well, first of all, on Google Earth, the overview of that area, um, I don't know the topography, however, but it shows cut lines in the forestation. So I don't know if that whole area has been looked at and searched. The other thought on the missing truck is that after reviewing the description of the the truck. It sounds like it's something that he took great pride in, and it was well kept. And the fact that it's it has not yet been found makes me believe that because it was in such good shape um, and and well kept, that someone has taken it 
and put it through a chop shop or perhaps had their own, very own chop shop. It will uh, be in pieces, rebuilt into a new color, new vehicle identification number from a wrecked vehicle, and perhaps even a different year, depending on if the parts were compatible. Other parts would have been marketed, uh, maybe even out of state, depending on the knowledge of the fencer. That's what I think. Okay. And so you think it's very possible that Donald could have struck up a friendship with this female and someone didn't take kindly to that relationship? His well, with his personality, I think that it wouldn't matter if it was an intimate, it, it wouldn't necessarily have to be an intimate relationship. Because of the what I, my understanding is of his personality, that it would even if she was being friendly with him, this 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 man, this uh, possible suspect, would have been jealous. Okay, so why, what type of offender do you think we're looking for? Well, someone is either carrying a grudge or jealousy, like I mentioned. Um, also noticed that there was a, a mention of a racing, mentioned that uh, they were involved in racing uh, vehicles, and I personally believe that this person has a pretty good knowledge about disposing of vehicles. In your opinion, what is it going to take to break this case wide open? Well, somebody knows something, and sooner or later, they're going to talk. Whether they know the exact details or they heard it mentioned, they're going to know who was talking about it. And perhaps that someone or someone who's heard the talk will turn the other person in, and I believe a reward is what is, what is needed, because money does talk. Thanks, Kelly, for being on tonight's podcast. We look forward to speaking with you again. And Thank I have, you, Mark. Okay, I have a quote for our listeners. Trust yourself. You know more than you think you do. Benjamin Spock. We want to thank our listeners. And we would like to give a special thanks to our three guests on tonight's podcast, Chris, Amy, and Callie. Always remember, folks, if you ever get bored with nothing to do, take a walk deep into the woods. You might be surprised what you might find. That's the end of tonight's podcast. My name is Mark, and good night from Plattsburgh, New York.